Okay, um, so I chose to talk today about uh, some recent work done in our lab on uh, 3D point processing with an emphasis on 3D point registration. And before going into the details, let me motivate what, uh, what inspired us to work on that. So the task is to take two point clouds, like the one you see on the left, and find the transformation that aligns them perfectly as you see on the right. And the first question to ask is why bother? Who needs this? And it turns out that uh, across multiple verticals, this is a crucial uh, step in almost any application. So all infrastructure companies, all construction companies need to create a digital twin, uh, replicate the world in digital form. And no sensor can capture the entire world at once. So you need to capture it piece by piece, and then you need to register the different pieces in order to get your digital twin. So in this example, you have this blue scan of the uh, world, you have this uh, green scan of the world, and you need to register both of them in order to get a larger piece of the world. Uh, properly digitized on your machine. This also applies when you're dealing with the human uh, uh, subjects. Uh, so this is very important in gaming industry, in the movie industry. So you want to create a digital clone of yourself that moves and behaves like you do. This is very important in athletes where you have all these uh, sports games uh, digital. And again, you have the same problem. You have multiple scans of the human body and you need to register it in order to get a nice uh, 3D model of the human body. And you need to integrate it over time if you want to capture the motion of a person. And this is of course also very important in medical imaging. If you have multiple 3D scans of a subject or a patient over time, you need to register it in order to, for instance, uh, register uh, in operation versus a preparatory uh, scan of the body, uh, model the person over time and see what changes happened and so on and so forth. And last but not least is an autom autonomous vehicles where you might have a leader uh, installed on the host vehicle, and it captures the 3D model of the world in front of it. And by registering uh, the uh, uh, 3D models uh, at each time step, you can recover the host uh, uh, vehicle motion and help the uh, navigate in the world. So for all these reasons, uh, 3D point cloud registration is an important task that needs to be addressed, and it has been addressed for many years. I'm going to show uh, our take on it and some other applications of 3D point clouds. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start. We have two point clouds that we want to register. And uh, to be concrete, we have point cloud P and point, point cloud Q. They might have a different number of points in each one of them. And the goal is very simple if you have registration. If we have for each point PI, the corresponding point uh, Q, uh, Q where we have the uh, matching function pi that tells us that pi corresponds to the point q. Formally, this is the expression that we want to minimize. We are seeking to recover the rotation and translation parameters such that they minimize this objective function. And all this objective function says is that we want for each point pi to apply some 3D rotation and translation such, such that it will fall exactly on the corresponding point q. Now, the problem is trivial if we have the corresponding points. The trick and the challenge that most algorithms uh, face is how to find these correspondences because once you do, then everything is trivial. So there has been a lot of work on that and the revolution of deep learning, one of the ways that it can be used uh, for 3D point cloud registration is to use uh, embedding. So what does it mean? Instead of trying to match this 3D point to the corresponding 3D point here, and you see that this is a wrong match because this is the right uh, uh, ear of the bunny and this is the left ear of the bunny, what you do is you learn an embedding, a nonlinear function that maps points from the input space to some embedding space, and then it finds matches in this new embedding space. And the learning process learns this embedding. This is the training part of the uh, deep uh, learning process. And on top of that, we have some uh, clever algorithm that uh, finds the corresponding matching points by finding mutual nearest neighbor in this uh, embedding space. I will not go into the details for lack of time. So this is just the one snapshot of the overall uh, network that we use. In comes the point clouds P and Q. 
and out comes the rotation and translation parameters. And what I want to emphasize here is that we're not using the black box in the sense that we're going to simply let the network automatically go from the point clouds to the rotation translation. What we do instead is we rely on the vast literature of classical algorithms of how to solve it. So this is the part that we use a, a, a CNN and transformers to do the embedding. And then we have this, uh, a distance matrix that we compute between every pair of points that is then used to determine correspondences. And eventually we have the least square solution. So really we relegate the deep learning part to only find matching points and we weigh them properly and then rely on previous algorithms, analytical solutions in order to find the correct uh, uh, parameters, the rotation translation. How do we train this uh, uh, method? Uh, this network, we're using the following loss function. It consists of three terms. Uh, basically, we start with uh, uh, some 3D point cloud, apply some transformation during training, and then uh, uh, let the network figure out that uh, transformation. So in order to do that, we define a loss function. The loss function consists of three terms, the uh, rotation. So we want to recover the rotation such that if we multiply it by the uh, ground truth rotation transpose, we get identity. We want to find translation that matches the uh, ground truth translation. And we have this nice uh, term over here that the, the interesting point here is this mask parameters uh, uh, gamma uh, gt. And I'll discuss this in a minute. So here is an example of the result that you uh, can get with our method. You see that you have two point clouds, uh, two scans of the airplane, and the algorithm properly matches points from the uh, orange point cloud to the blue point cloud. Now, this is all good and well, but in practice, this is not the type of data you expect. In practice, what you get is something like this. So you get uh, partial overlap, you get missing parts, and then if you simply try to find the rotation translation that matches every point in one point cloud to the corresponding point in the other one will fail because clearly there is no matching point for these points Q in the uh, point cloud P. And that's the uh, gamma parameter that I mentioned earlier that, that is used as a mask that allows us to mask points that do not have correspondences. And what you see here is what happens if P and Q are completely, uh, uh, all the points are available. This is 100% overlap. But if you have 75% or 50% overlap, you'll see that the mask will tell us for each point in P how likely it is to have a corresponding point in Q. And you'll see that all these points do not have, uh, have a, a, a very high value of the mask, meaning that we should not try too hard to find the corresponding match for them in Q. And this is just a visualization of the type of results you can expect. Um, so what you see here on the left is the original uh, pair of uh, point clouds. And these are several competing methods, and this is our results. And you see that you get a very nice alignment despite the uh, um, partial overlap, noise, etc. Now, this works not only on toy problems, it works only on very large scale. Uh, data sets. In this case, these are uh, LIDAR data sets. You have here two point clouds superimposed one on top of the other. You see they are not properly registered. And after applying the registration, you get a much better result. In this case, the data set consists of more than 100,000 points uh, each. So this shows the type of uh, results you can expect from registration. And what I want to do now is describe a couple of other applications that either stem from or are related to uh, point clouds. Uh, registration or point cloud processing uh, in general. So one of the things that we did is we had to sample uh, the point cloud. So if you have 100,000 points, it's too much and you need to sample it. And what people usually do is they use something known as furthest point sampling, which is some sampling over the point cloud to reduce the number of points from let's say 100,000 to 1,000 or so. But this sampling is done regardless of the downstream task. And towards this end, we developed a, a new algorithm called learning to sample or sample net, where the basic idea is that you want to do the sampling subject to downstream tasks. So if you have a classification problem, 
you want to sample some set of points subject to uh, the downstream task of classification. If you want to do registration, you want to do something uh, subject to registration. If you want to do reconstruction, you want to do something subject to reconstruction. So we devised an algorithm, uh, essentially a, a new neural network called SampleNet that determines how to sample the original shape such that the downstream task will not suffer or will not suffer too much, okay? And the important thing to notice here is that different downstream applications use different samples of the original point clouds. Now, why is it good for? It's good for uh, to reduce the amount of data that you need to store or communicate or transmit because the sample net will only choose the points that are relevant to the downstream task. And just to give you a sense of uh, the, import, the improvement that you can gain, this is a classification task. Uh, there are 40 classes, and this is the uh, classification accuracy axis, and this is the sampling ratio uh, axis. So you see that if you do no sampling, you use the entire data set, you reach about 90% accuracy. The interesting thing here is that if you do uh, 32 times sampling, meaning you are left with just 3% of the data, your accuracy using uh, traditional methods will drop to about uh, less than 30% accuracy. But if you're using our method, your accuracy will degrade gracefully to only about 80%, okay? So this is done completely automatic. I'm showing here uh, the case of classification, the same applies for registration or reconstruction. Okay, so far I've been talking about uh, uh, rigid transformation as it's known. So there are uh, only six degrees of freedom, three rotation and three trans translation. Uh, what we've been doing lately is uh, deformable registration. And here are the results. And what you see here is one shape of a human, and here you have another shape of a human. And as you can see, these are deformable objects. So there is no rotation translation, a single set of uh, numbers that will map points from here to here. What you need to do is determine for each point in the left, the left shape where it uh, matches the the right shape. And this color code shows that we found the correct matching for all points. This is done completely automatic. Training is also done completely automatic. It handles properly the symmetric problem and the left leg matches the left leg and the right leg the, the right leg. And you, you see the nice uh, result that you get here. And we're not assuming that this is uh, the human body per se. The same approach can be applied to other deformable objects, in this case, a cat. Okay, so we have another nice algorithm that allows you to do registration, in this case, not a rigid registration, but a, a, a deformable registration. The last but not least uh, problem that I want to mention is uh, adversarial examples. So adversarial examples gained a lot of uh, reputation in recent years. The basic idea is that you can slightly perturb the input image and it will be classified instead of a dog, it will be classified as a cat. What we're proposing for the first time is a geometric adversarial attack and it looks as follows. So suppose you're given an input shape like so, and you want to store or transmit it. So the way you will usually do it, you'll use an autoencoder and then you'll store the latent vector uh, on disk and then you'll use uh, the decoder to open it back to the original shape. So that's the standard approach that people are using autoencoders. What we proposed is a, ge a geometric adversarial attack that slightly perturbed the input point cloud to look like so. And you see that the points are slightly moving away from the shape, but overall it still looks like a bench, maybe a noisy bench, but not uh, too, too bad. What happens now is that if you use the same autoencoder and expect to get the same noisy bench on the other side, you're in for a surprise because we created a geometric adversarial attack that will map this bench to a van. And we've shown it for a lot of different uh, categories uh, across a, a lot of different uh, architectures. So this is another uh, topic that uh, should deserve uh, future research. And it's important, especially when you're dealing with robots that needs not only, not only to reason about the semantics of the world, but also about the geometry of the world. So if you have an object and suddenly through the autoencoder, it changes shape to a completely different thing, then you should be aware of this type of attack and plan accordingly. Okay, I think I, uh, I'll stop here. I summarized uh, different research done in our lab, including registration, sampling, 
uh, both types of re registration, both rigid and deformable, as well as geometric uh, adversarial type. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, Shai, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, let's say we have overlapping objects. Uh, it's known to be some problem with um, the solution. Uh, so what are the regularization techniques that would you suggest to use or maybe you are using for this uh, topic? So um, in the rigid transformation, what we are recovering is the rotation translation parameters, which are six parameters. In addition, we also estimate for each point how likely it is to have a matching point in the other point cloud. And if it's not likely, then we mask it, essentially give it a, a high score saying this is probably a point without a match and therefore we are able to do the proper matching. And it's a crucial step in every realistic system. Okay, great. Uh, another question, um, this is uh, from audience. So uh, can you elaborate on how training was formed given that network is only part of solution? So in the rigid transformation uh, scenario? So in, in the rigid? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's the question. Uh, OK. Uh, so OK, no so I gave the answer, and the audience will fit the question. Um, so the way you do it, it's uh, completely unsupervised in the sense that you take a point cloud, <clears throat> you randomly apply some rotation translation, you randomly uh, uh, crop some uh, of the points, and now you've generated a pair of point clouds that you know the ground truth, you know the proper rotation translation, you know the mask, which point was uh, mapped, which point was removed, and then you feed it to the network uh, in order to do the training. And once you've done training, in real in the inference time, the system simply takes two point clouds, processes them, and outputs the rotation translation, and we achieve state of the art results on uh, several benchmarks. Okay, hope uh, this answers the question. Uh, I have another question also. Um, do you think that graph neural nets are a proper tool for this sort of application because you're dealing with point clouds and we know that? This is a very uh, proper tool to deal with that kind of uh, data. What so, is your opinion on this? Yeah, so, so one needs to uh, be careful. There are two types of uh, network architecture. One is graph uh, neural networks. Another one is point net based algorithms that essentially digest the uh, point clouds. Now, the difference between the two is that in a graph, you assume you know neighborhood. And this is a very tricky problem. It's very easy when you have smooth surfaces and it's easy to es estimate or establish the neighborhood. But if you have like a person holding his hands like so, it's very easy to confuse and create uh, shortcuts that hurt the performance. And the reason I, I am interested in the uh, point cloud and not the mesh or the graph level of it is that Point clouds are the output of all the scanning devices. So if you use a LiDAR, if you're using uh, stereo and you uh, generate uh, uh, point clouds, this is the raw data and it's always best to go to the source and process it instead of rely on some intermediate steps. Okay, excellent. I have uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, can you please note again the effect of the last product from the loss function from previous slides? Yeah, um, so I don't know if I can do it. Let's quickly do that. So the first two terms are trivial. You just want to uh, find the rotation translation. This term here, what it does is the mask. So it tells you that you ideally want to map the point P using the rotation translation to the point Q. However, if there is no matching point Q to the point P, then you'll give this uh, term a value of zero and it does not introduce an outlier that affects your uh, solution. So this is a crucial term that needs to be uh, added to the loss function or else the algorithm will not converge. And if it converges, it will converge to the wrong uh, solution. 